The theme, uh, optional theme, is what if. Um, that's quite a nice theme to inspire alternate universes, fiction, different memos, memoirs, whole thing. Very lively. So um, tonight is one night in our American history right now for Iowa. So I wrote something for us. It's fiction. Marla's manifesto i want to be batman i want to be taylor swift or no i want to be kamala okay i don't want to be batman if she's going to be kamala i want to be trump roger Kristen. okay okay i want to be on time for work we can go shopping for masks after supper on the commute into phoenix single mom marla Thinks back to her days of really good Halloween when she was her kid's age. Curvy, oak-lined, suburban roads, getting great masks in Schenectady, taking Pamela, her babysitter, sister, her baby sister, to the scary houses, freezing most years, not boiling like the world is now. And that makes her remember Pam's latest text from last night. Still living in upstate New York, Pam has been royal pissed all this past summer how the voting makes for swing states, which get to be the only place a vote counts for much. But now that Marla is registered in Arizona, Pam is annoying and relentless. May come down to a dozen ballots, Marla. Your one vote could save democracy, save the world. Like she doesn't know or care. She gets to the office early. They want her to sit in on a client meeting today. Just listen, Bob said yesterday. Your experience could be handy for us on this one. Marla figures the experience must be her divorce. She talks too much about it in the break room. She and William own some land in Montana with five fracking wells they have to split. She and William, or William wants it all. Marla says she just wants to be a single mother, meaning no kids, just joking. <laughs> just give me somewhere with a breeze. Just give me somewhere to get laid, she said one day and regretted it immediately. She probably meant somewhere I can cry. Marla stands at the greeting table as the two teams of blue suits come in. They go stand around the huge mahogany conference table, drinking coffee, talking golf. Bob nods and they sit. Bob winks over to Marla mime something like take notes 9:45. bob has her turn down the lights and the slides start up some woman from la team points to a map marla sits by the back wall she opens her phone and checks facebook pictures of rocky terrain where come on yet another high school friend is vacationing in iceland she taps the space where the prompt says What's on your mind? I wish Kristen would ask me that. Ma Mom, what's on your mind? I would tell her I have a lot going on. She writes in the white space. Okay, so what's up with Iceland? Why is everyone going to Iceland? Posts it. Two likes pop in right away. Well then. She nods herself out of the meeting, somehow mining bathroom, takes a stall, and taps out a reply inside her own post. They go there because it is melting. Post it. Pam, her sister, gives her a thumbs up. Marla starts a new post. These hurricanes, she writes, they are like never. The election, okay. They don't talk about it. America the Great is a furnace. If this guy wins next week, are they really 
going to let him put up his hand in January and swear to that judge, I do? That would be about as smart as me believing my guy when he said, I do, at the altar. He should have said, to the best of my ability, I will F you. Folks, she continues, please vote, and democracy really is the thing to save, at least this time. But then they have to get going and save a much bigger thing. My kids this morning were talking about who to be for Halloween. Well, I say, let's all be Mother Earth, you know? Trick or treat for that. These children and all over the world, they're not going to have anything if we don't. And maybe it all goes before I am totally dead. Posted it, 1042, in the ladies' room. Pam liked it. Marla sneaks back into the conference. Easy to do because they have started up the arguing, as lawyers must. Smells like a gym. Bob looks over at her and tips his head like, you okay there? And mimes to her to open the door just to cry. At noon, she wheels in the lunch carts. At three, she thanks the visiting team from LA. At five, back on the road. At seven, she tells Kristen and Roger she posted a thing today. Kristen says, yeah, I liked it. Angry face it because that is badass stuff. You said before you are dead. It's like if you shot up the mall tonight, the 11 o'clock news would say, Phoenix mall shooter posted manifesto. And mom, they will add employee at Crandall and Smark because you posted from work. Marla screams and cries. Kristen says, can't you delete it, Mom? Kristen calls up the post. Look, Roger, that's her brother. Look, Roger, she got 14 likes, two hearts, one cry, one hug, and one angry. Roger read through the comments. What? They're all about Halloween candy. True, it was. The first one was urging use of individual wrappers. Next guy said they give out $10 bills, to which a woman says that after COVID, you have to use fresh bills. And people are all about where do you get them? Which banks are best? And then this. You give those brats tens. You're effing insane libtards. I give them burnt toast. But here's what makes this a story. The last one. We are all toast. That, you dorks, is what Marla is posting about. It was her William, her husband. Kristen took a screenshot. Marla nodded, wiped her eyes nodded again, and deleted the post. 7.30, with her manifesto sucked back into the digital ether, Marla felt okay. By the time they got to the Halloween pop-up out on Route 17 in Glendale, and were looking at rows of mocking rubber masks of celebs and politicians, she was even better than that. She had found a Mother Earth costume. And now let's welcome to the Iowa stage, Kristen Grippo. Thank you, Ted. What a follow-up. I'm Kristen Grippo, and after me is Kim Kaufman. Warm PC. Can you just let me know if I get up to five? Like, ish, just give me a wave. I know. Oh, I'm small. Smaller than Ted. Is that good? Let's see. Um, okay, so it's long ago. I'm 30 years old. I am in Sicily in the second week of a five week tour, no, travels alone solo tour. And I am on a bus with 40 older Irish tourists. 
and a tour gu- a French tour guide who also speaks Italian. Now to back up, um, I had <laughs> I had left a fiance and then a year later left uh, took a year off from my public school teaching career because um, it was eating my soul and I was lost and searching. So uh, I headed to Sicily with a suitcase and planned a five-week trip without a return ticket, uh, much to the dismay of my family. Uh, And uh, I was in Cefalu, which is a beautiful beach town on the northern coast of Sicily. Uh, And I was lonely because I don't really speak Italian. I speak Spanish pretty well. Then I spoke Spanish better than I spoke Italian. Um, so it was cool, but I was lonely. And uh, I had a little play- apartment I was staying at, and I'd ride my bike to the beach um, and just, like, hang out on the beach. Um, and this one day, I'm, I'm walking down the beach, and this I come across this woman who I'm happy to find speaks English, and she's Irish. Uh, and she tells me, oh, we're we, I'm on this tour uh, this, with all of these other Irish folks. And uh, tomorrow we're going to Agrigento, which is a a city which houses um, the largest uh, Greek ruins outside of Greece, because Sicily has been taken over by every possible culture. And so there's Greek ruins there. Uh, And and that was on my list of places to visit, my personal list. Um, And it wasn't too far of a bus ride south and and west. And I said, oh, I'm planning to go there. And she said, well, why don't you come? My husband is really tired of the walking and the touring and he's not going to go. So there's actually an extra seat. And so that's how I found myself the next morning on a bus tour with 40 Irish tourists and a French tour guide. Um, So we got to Agrigento and it really was beautiful and ancient and um, with the columns and the crumbling. Uh, but particularly what I recall was uh, this woman, this other woman that I met. She was by far the eldest of the Taurus. Um, and she had white flowing hair and was dressed in uh, flowing clothes and blues and purples and grays. I wouldn't have said it then, but a very sort of um, like Waldorfy lady. Um, <laughs> like vibe wise, um, she was a, div- she felt like a divine one and, uh, her name was Miriam and we immediately hit it off and spent kind of the rest of the day arm in arm touring. And she had a sense about her that was so light and easy and happy. And me at 30 lost and searching, I just, um, I, I don't think I've I'd ever encountered someone like that. Uh, and so we became fast friends. Uh, and uh, I, we toured, we went to one, we went to lunch. And I, I remember, you know, I'm, uh, I learned quickly. I had been to Italy before and every, the first time I was there, I learned quickly. I, I, I see myself really as Italian American and I grew up, I've spoke about this here, but I grew up. Um, really still with much of that culture embedded as a kid on Long Island. Like um, we, we ate in a, we only really ate like Italian food where my friends were having sloppy joes um, and tacos. Um, we, I was a little, a little closer, a little less removed culturally from my friends. Um, that said, the, the first time I arrived in Italy, I learned I'm American. <laughs> I'm very much an American girl, you know. Um, however, being having lunch with these Italian, um, excuse me, these Irish tourists. Still, I was sort of laughing to myself because they had no idea. So even like whatever the espresso or the demi tasse, um, or what did we have? Um, I, it it might have been I don't even. It's such a cliche. It might have been cannoli or something like that. But they were really like totally in awe and blown away um, by this. And for me, I was like, oh, okay. Like I kind of am a little more familiar. Um, so. Later in the evening, we returned back to to Chefalu, and the day didn't end because Miriam said there is uh, this show at this little old theater. Would you join me? And I said, of course. The show was called Bubble Magic, 
and it was for children. <laughs> it was, I mean, there were all kinds of folks there, but it was really a show for kids. And there was a magician on stage doing all kinds of like magic things with bubbles. And I remember this very clearly, um, looking over at this woman, this elder woman, uh, and the, the bubbles filling the auditorium and her delight, her just pure delight, um, without pretense, without care, uh, at the bubbles. Uh, and, and I, I traveled for many more weeks after that, but that stayed with me, this, this lesson about um, it not mattering who I was, where I lived, what my work was or wasn't, uh, that living with an open heart, that's all there is. That's it. Um, I've forgotten, you know, I've forgotten that lesson and come back to that lesson over and over and over. And the joy in like remembering this story is that right now. And I, I, I want to thank Miriam because I'm, I'm, it would be amazing if she is still alive. Um, so I want to thank the spirit of that, of her who, um, has continued to bring me that lesson that, um, moving through with an open heart is, is what we are, what we have, right? That our hearts are brave and strong. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so I, I traveled, uh, several more weeks around Sicily and had some adventures and met some folks, but was still kind of lonely. And I'm going to jump out to jump back in. I am going to be telling this story tomorrow night in Pittsfield to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month at an open mic. And I will be telling it in Espanol. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is the first time I've ever done something like that. See, sí, in Spanish. Más o menos, more or less, hmm? more or less with the words that I know. Um, and so, so I say that because um, I traveled for five weeks, but what I figured out was that every time I ran into somebody who spoke Spanish, I felt more alive and I felt more comfortable and I felt less alone. And so at the end of that trip, rather than buying a plane ticket back to New York, uh, I bought a ticket to Madrid and I flew to Madrid and I was there for about five months, but that is another story. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So now welcome Kim Kaufman. Hi. I'm Kim Kaufman. <laughs> and next up is Sonia Pilser. I'm going to read a few poems. I looked through for what ifs. And this poem was written when I thought, what is if life is like a seam ripper? <laughs> it's called the seam ripper. <laughs> yes. Seam ripper. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. The Seam Ripper. I wake to moonlight that looks like morning, getting up before I realize it's night. I walk the hall to find my work, a nine patch quilt with sashing. The careful construction of two inch strips has dulled the design. It's got to go. The care, uh, that. I find the scene ripper under the table, taking the fabric off the design wall. I sit to pick and pull, move the lamp closer for clarity. Good sense says go back to bed, but I start the process of finding give, opening scenes, parting the attached. I see where I have been uneven, where I rushed or tarried a line I readed twice in a hurry. It's slow, this careful thrust and pull. My foot pushes into the floor, arches away from ground. 
my shoulders up around my ears, I concentrate on the slide and pull of the tool. Hold my breath, eye intent on the line. I find myself in the same position when writing, hunched toward the page, body tense with the effort of extracting words from my mind. It hurts, this contortion of strain, the unconscious bunching of muscle, the struggle to be free. It's fastidious work, the picking out of what was formed before, the frame that doesn't work anymore. Small puncture marks from the needle are left behind. I pull bits of thread, amassing a pile of snippets no longer joined. Some stitches are tight, some smooth going. They release their hold. Strips come free, the pieces part. They've become shape many patterns, whoops, shape, color born with promise, embracing many patterns, the widening of thought, I put them back in play, test and turn, replace until I find form again. A risky proposition. Nope. What if you remember at any moment you might die? COVID or car accident, random shooting, crossing the street, heart failure, wasp sting. There's no guaranteed safety. It might happen any time. A, di a diagnosis of stage four cancer and gone two weeks later, this might be the last time you leave your house. You may walk in the wake of someone's breath and come home infected, infect others unknowing. Lie down in a field of Queen Anne's lace and black-eyed Susans. Wake to a mushroom cloud on your horizon. One breath to the next, filled with uncertainty. It's just that we are here. The sky is blue. The birds have returned. There's a smell of moist earth in the air. The breath of love the breath of death, both full of possibility. Lambs jumping, noisy peepers, buzzards circling. And this is the last one. It's called, It's Coming Down the Track. The engineer's alert. Can't see in a dense fog. Automation doesn't always work. Deer on the track. Cow in the way, red squirrel in the wrong place. Hunk of metal running headlong down the line, pull the lever, push the button, hard meets soft. The train hurries toward me, no sick days off, no family days. The schedule pushes hard, pushes long hours, fewer people, pushes brain fog. Mom burns down the house with a can of Campbell's soup. A cleated foot crunches an ankle. The train keeps coming red lights flashing, someone's empty heart handed, heart stilled. The law says back to work, no protest, no change, train wreck coming, dense fog in the nation, train to nowhere full of goods for the taking, taking, click clack around the track, sound crash, metal screech, bent lying on the ground, a hat, a hand, glasses, a book, sock, person. We hold hands without seeing, and it all starts again. The cycling of wheels crushing it, connecting here, here. So many voices clanging metal on metal, bells, wheels on rails, pipes clattering, a child with a pot and spoon, a sleeping driver and a guardrail. Train wreck is us, butting heads, going off the rails, the dramatic plunge from a bridge into the landscape of the dead and maimed. In of broken, twisted metal, of screeching fear, of sp sparks, explosion, fire, the flattened penny, body tied to the rails, car in the crossing. Looking and not believing, ignoring the signs, the studies, the weather, the coming scarcity and migrations, impending chaos down the line, bullet train of geologic time, 
the engine that could, that soon cannot, the mountain's decline, the tunnels we are in, the dense fog of misunderstanding. Ancestors, past and future, watch us, pray for us, our phones flickering, frogs dying, trees falling, microplastics in our water. Swig it down with a toast to joy, a rush of wind, speed of light. Someone has a gun. The train approaches the bend, too fast, too fast. You are unable to see clearly, blindsided by fear of getting lost, of going bump in the night while stumbling toward the bathroom. But the train has a track, a known route to follow. You have a dream of what real may be, derailed at any moment by death a fire, a baby, a thief, a misstep, getting off the train at the wrong stop, destiny in twisted metal towards stop. The children are waiting. The train is coming, the train is coming. They run to the windows and door, wave wildly to the man in the cab. The engineer waves back at eager upraised hands. A long line of graffitied cars pass out of sight. Before the spellbound children are released and return to play after the haunting of the horn, as days go clacking down the track, a moment of cracked glass tumbles through air. Yeah. <laughs> now welcome Sonia Pilser. Hi, I'm Sonia Pilser. You can hear me. Um, the next person is Eileen Marcus. So um, what I'm going to read is a confession. And I would never tell my students this, for example. Um, but I want to share this, OK? Why I don't write no more. Here's what I tell myself, one. I've mostly said, written, published what I have to say. Two, I don't want to share anymore. Three, I've lost the desire to cut into a vein and reveal its darkness. I ha Four, I have a newfound sense of privacy and self-protection. At first, I thought it was just one of my sabbatical sabbaticals. I took months off at a time when I couldn't even write a dream down, when I was allergic to my writing machines. Fight the devil of insolence, of indolence, I'm sorry. Fight the devil of indolence, I urged myself. Write through it. Face the black demon. Go on, a thousand words. You can't stop. I was driven by voices in my head. You wasted a day. Do you know how precious that is? I recalled how my father, a survivor of Auschwitz, referred to useless eaters. The writer's life is a difficult one, Martin Amos noted. You're alone. You're an instrument of self-torture. Ambition and anxiety are the writer's daily bread the writer's only sustenance. I consulted Paul Lipman, a well-known therapist in Stockbridge, also a gifted musician, painter, writer. What can I do? Should I try to force myself to write? And I have, believe me, it won't help. He shook his head sagely. This frequently happens to artists. You can't do anything about it. When I asked how long it lasted, he said, who knows? Then he related a story about a painter friend who couldn't work for 10 years. I thought of Fran Lebowitz, whose famous writer's block has lasted over 50 years after two modest books published in her 20s. Could it be mental menopause? My writer's estrogen has leached out, leaving me dry and parched. Should I get a hormone patch? I continued to obsess, especially when I read about other writers who I had come up with, met at Yaddo, knew from pen committees, who were publishing new books. I tortured myself with my near successes, 
my first novel, Teen Angel, was optioned, and I wrote the screenplay with Gary Marshall. Mostly I focused on my failures. And there was COVID. That's when my friend Deborah told me about the Daily Sit, a Zoom meditation from the Barry Center of Buddhist Studies. Beginning to meditate and study Buddhism, I learned how to watch my thoughts like clouds passing over in a blue sky. Let go, let be. I discovered kind eyes which watch over and within and helped me create a kinder, kinder internal holding environment. The cruel, tyrannical voice stilled a little, which dulled the blade of my ambition and anxiety. It's a good thing I didn't learn TM in my 20s and 30s or I would never have written my books. And it's a good thing that blade has dulled. There's age, too. It can slow you down. It certainly lessens the interest of the world in you as an artist. Besides, not too many septuagenarians have the stamina for the game. My last novel took several years to write. My agent pressed one key to submit to 40 publishers. The, re the rejections came almost instantaneously. When I finally published with a very small press, the novel disappeared like a pebble in a pond. Yet the pen persists. I'm writing in a school notebook as I've done for at least five decades. It's ink flowing into black words across lined pages. Once in a blue moon, as my mother would say, or for IWOW, salvation for so many of us. I go for my walk after meditation, accompanied by the deer and birds, whose sounds are the white noise of my life, pesky squirrels underfoot, the leaves slowly turning, and the colors of the lake. The water is rough today. Thank you. Please welcome Eileen Marcus. I'm Eileen Marcus, and after me will be Deborah Phelps. I think I'm going lower. <laughs> lower. Down, down, down. I'm going to do a little experiment. I have some notes, but I'm going to try to tell a story. I really like the theme, what if. What if I opened my notebook and I had written in disappearing ink and none of it was there? What if I pulled this thread and it fell apart all over the place and I had to pick it up? What if dessert always came first? What if my cell phone never needed charging? What if I followed the sign when you go over through Connecticut over to Martha's Crotch, which is on its way past Millerton, over to, um, what's it called there, Millbrook? There's a big sign that says, use both lanes on a hill. So I do. I go right up the middle. I use both lanes. How do I explain that to the cop? What if he stops me? Use both lanes, the sign said. What if I followed directions on the Q-tip box? and didn't actually put the Q-tip in my ear canal? What if I didn't clean my ears? What if I didn't need sadness to find joy? What if I didn't need darkness to find light? What if I didn't need aloneness to find not being alone? I have spent a lot of time this last week at the Big Y Pharmacy. We were joking today, I've been there every day, getting to know the people, and we were joking, everybody's like, this is the place to be, the pharmacy. I'm like, yes. Years ago it was the florist, then it was the hot bar, now it's the pharmacy. Oh, there, there, there were times it was the butcher, right, what they were cutting, but now it's the pharmacy, right? As we age, we go, we have problems, we regroup, we keep on doing. What if I didn't have to go to the pharmacy? What if the person who cut in front of me when I was going down the double yellow for the seven miles hadn't cut in front of me and then started going 30 miles an hour in a 45. What if? What, what if I had left five minutes earlier? What if the lady that I had met today who 
really was lonely and needed to talk, told me her whole story about losing her third husband and the cancer she survived and told me about, you know, how she doesn't have the health insurance now since her husband died. And I thought, what if I hadn't learned anything? Because I looked at her and said, three husbands, you're blessed. Celebrate that. I'm looking for number two. You know, like you did good. Celebrate the loss. Celebrate the fact that we have state insurance, Obamacare, that you can pay for your things as she picked up her, her, um, her, her prescriptions. Celebrate the fact that you walked into Big Y and you brushed your hair and you got here and you were still able to drive. And celebrate the fact that you survived cancer even though you have trouble breathing and you can get there. And she looked at me quizzically and said, that's pretty positive. And I said, what if we looked at the world that way? Why not? That's all good. What if I was grateful just for the cup of coffee, for the clothes on my back, for being able to breathe? What if my chicken soup always came out perfect every time? What if there was always a parking spot right in front when I need it? What if I was never short of funds and had all the money I needed? Everything I want is on the other side of not asking, not wondering, what if. If I just stop what ifing, I will be on the other side. My new mantra is, I am, we are, I am, I, I am, no, this is, I am, we are. This is, I am, we are. I'm right where I'm supposed to be, even when I'm behind the lady going 35 miles an hour when I want to crawl out of my skin. Always finding reasons to laugh, to show up. What if, what if, instead of asking, what if, I lived as if today was exactly as it should be? The lady, the pharmacy, my dog barking, the clothes that don't fit. And what if that changed everything? Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Deborah Phelps, and up next will be Kitty Keefer. What if? What if Mary Roberta Lewis, just home from college for the summer, hadn't accepted an invitation to dinner and a blind date from her cousin Lorraine Strong? It should be noted she did hesitate, almost declined, because she and Lorraine were very different people. Doug wasn't her type, and if Doug's friend was like him, she wouldn't be interested. But on second thought, she didn't have anything better to do, so she accepted the invitation. And since she had no car, Lorraine picked her up. What if Merrill Topping Hildreth, high school friend of Doug Strong, hadn't shown up for dinner and a blind date? Do to overtime at Hildreth and Company, a general store post office he owned with his father. But he did show up, albeit an hour later than expected, and he was quite handsome and kind. Mary Lewis and Merrill Hildreth hit it off, and Merrill drove her home at the end of the evening. They married following her college graduation. Their first child, Deborah Gale Hildreth, was born three years later. What if Deborah Gale Hildreth hadn't grown up near the ocean and met Jack Tilton, a summer kid, hadn't switched her college major from early childhood education to art in order to actually learn something, as she put it, and as a result, 
the family's neighbor, painter Robert Dash, hadn't insisted she bring her portfolio to his studio for review and then recommended her to a local gallery owner who hired her as a summer assistant. Because the following year, having accepted an offer to summer in Greece, Deborah recommended Jack Tilton, soon to be director of the Betty Parsons Gallery in New York City, to fill in for her as summer assistant, which led two years later to Deborah becoming assistant to Betty Parsons. Within weeks of starting the job in New York City, gallery artist Susan Weil said to Deborah, you should study Tai Chi with Maggie Newman. Since Deborah had no idea what Tai Chi was, mm -hmm. and she was new to New York City, she didn't pursue it until two years later when a secretary at NRDC, Jane, said, you should study Tai Chi with Maggie Newman. <laughs> and so, for the next six years, Deborah studied Tai Chi with Maggie Newman. What if Virginia May Kasser and George Howard Phelps hadn't met at Divinity School, married, and three years later given birth to a second son, Theodore Kasser Phelps? What if Theodore Kasser Phelps hadn't learned about Tai Chi from a buddy at college and studied it with Ed Young, a colleague of Maggie Newman? <laughs> and if several years later, Ed hadn't suggested Theodore attend a workshop he was leading for Maggie in Rochester, which put Ted on Maggie's mailing list. What if in November 1986, Deborah Hildreth and Theodore Phelps hadn't each chosen to attend their first Tai Chi meet with Maggie Newman in New York City and met doing push hands. But they did, and a year and a half later, they married. What if, following a move to Columbia County, Deborah and Ted hadn't noticed an advertisement in the Columbia paper for a Tai Chi meet in nearby Chatham, where they met David Wade Smith, a student of Tai Chi from the same lineage, became friends, and met Alyssa Novak, who invited them to David's memorial at the Deb Kaufman Gallery where they learned about IWOW. Aww. What if? Uh, <laughs> and, and now, please welcome Kitty Kiefer. Susan? No one has arrived. I'm it. You got to sing now. <laughs> no, I don't. Um, my name is Kitty, K I T T Y, Keeper. Can you hear me or should I up it? Up it. How about like that? Okay. <clears throat> so, this is a piece I've struggled with for years. <clears throat> and when the prompt, what if, came, I realized what this piece was about. So anyway, what if I could change? There is a place <clears throat> where my family and ancestors have visited for over 150 years in the estuary of the Savannah River. It is an island, one of the Golden Isles of Georgia. On the north end are the remains of a small cannon emplacement of the ninth excuse me, the 1898 Spanish-American War. When it was built, the fort was probably about 120 yards wide with a cave-like place in the center to keep the powder out of the rain and to offer bunker protection for the men as they loaded and shot the guns. If ships from Cuba ever arrived, a runner would notify the officers who were staying inland from the fort 
and the powder and shot would be brought to the emplacement in carts drawn by mules. The Spaniards never made it past South Florida, so this fort never fired a shot. Now the island is forever wild. I try to visit it one or two times a year. It is off the radar screen of modern living. The federal government has control of just about all of the forest, <clears throat> marshes, and beach as a wildlife refuge. Not much has changed since the 1930s. The forest is wild, but we have reserved the rights to pass and repass in the forest. By 1975, the storms had sucked away much of the sand under the fort, and it has cracked and moved down in lopsided ways. The tide comes into it and around it. The waves break over it. It is covered with barnacles and seaweed, but it is still there. You cannot sit on the walls anymore. There's too much growing on them. But you can catch sea bass in the water around it at low tide. And there are blue crabs in the water sometimes. Whatever time of year I visit, I walk to the fort as a constitutional. It is about two miles one way, so it is almost a four mile walk round trip. Most of the walk is on the beach. I try to be barefoot on the beach. But it can be too cold in the winter and the sand too hard for comfort. I walk with low splashes in the surf, walking and dreaming. I can feel the water move between my toes and stream over the arches of my feet. Sometimes I bird watch with binoculars and a bird guide in a belt pack. Sometimes I take photographs. Sometimes I just walk. No one comes with me or even offers to. On a recent visit, two days before Christmas, I walked at low tide down to the fort <clears throat> looking for shells. In December, no people native to this coast were on the beach, so my competition for any shells was minimal. No one else was out beach walking. At the north end, there's a big sandbar that reaches first east and then south. We have called the bar Cape Charlotte, not for my grandmother, but for her grandmother. Always at the north end on Cape Charlotte at low tide, there are black skimmers and brown pelicans, birds easily recognized. Then there is a mix of terns, gull, and sanderling in the winter. If there has been a recent storm with wind, there is usually a peregrine falcon or two on the land, but always at the north end. Cape Charlotte is a rough patch in the ocean at high tide, a shoal to catch unwary boats. On my walks, I never interact with any wildlife. Nothing chases me. The birds lift off and circle when I get too close. They settle right back where they were after I pass. They are there when I return. Any bull alligators headed to or from the ocean give me wide berth and I them. Alligators are not seen often in December. So I made it to the fort. No shells in my hands, no camera, no binoculars. I walked around the fort as it was dead low tide, looked into the pools of seawater for life, saw none, headed back to return on the dry sand above where the normal high tides reach. That sand was warm and soft and dry and felt good on my feet. I rounded the northeastern point. No birds lifted. Two gulls were down by the water, about 150 yards away. They turned toward me, watching. I found two same-sized cockle shells, a left and a right. They're soft brown and white bivalves with stripes. These were the size of my cupped palms. They weren't a pair, but close. I picked them up. Then a bit further, I saw a complete little tailed crustacean about four inches long. It was green, still alive with its legs respirating and moving. I was afraid to pick it up. The seagulls must have fought over it and dropped it. It wasn't dead, but it soon would be in this dry, war, this dry warm sand. <clears throat> I'd been reading some Buddhist writings. I watched the legs move slowly. It must have sensed that I was close. In the world of Buddha, who might this be in a shrimp incarnation? A shrimp found by me in a place where shrimp ought not to be 
and this shrimp was alive. Living crustaceans are not favorites of mine. Where I learned to swim, there were many, many green crabs on the very too close bottom. I still cringe to think about <clears throat> them and all that kept those claws away from me, my very, very small feet, was my fear and my grip of the flutterboard. I swam in self-defense. So I'm afraid of living crustaceans in general. And now I was afraid of this one specifically, a little scratchy, squirmy non-mammal. If I reached for it, it would grab my fingers. But I had just begun to understand karma, that I as a living human being can control or form some of my karma by my responses to life, living things and events, that I might reap what I've sown, I might get what I deserve. All of us to some extent are afraid of dying. We talk about fear of death as common and shared. I wouldn't like to be in my death throes in agony with something standing there watching me. In my karmic analysis, I didn't have to let it die. Whether or not it was afraid of death didn't matter. It was working on living. But because it was alive, I was afraid of it. Then I thought, do not be afraid of life. I gently picked it up between the cockles and it rested in the bowls of the shells. I shut the shells around it. As I walked toward the ocean at low tide, the two gulls became interested in me. The little crustacean began to squirm in the shells, scratchy noises, and there was a strength pushing against the shells that I had clamped around it in my hand. It was very much alive. I got to a muddy section of the ocean where there was black, black clay in the sand stirred up by the waves and underhanded the shells and the being into the sea. The gulls could not see the crustacean swimming away. Neither could I. I do not know what happened to it. I know what happened to me. I walked the next two miles to the house marveling at, do not be afraid of life. I cannot refute the thought. Yeah.